really weird, uh, but it looks like we've, we've found our way in now, so. I think so, yeah, yeah. Technology is one of those things that it's great when it works, but then perplexing <laughs> sometimes when it doesn't, of course. Absolutely. Cool. Um, we're just gonna try to uh, record. Oh, Kelsey's recording, great, we're good to go. Thanks, guys. Awesome, okay. Cool, yeah, so we'll get, we'll get started. Um, yeah, so thanks so much for, for joining this session. Um, the title of which is Building Blockchain Solutions for the Enterprise with Truffle. So my name is Kevin Bluer, and you just heard Ben in the background, Ben Burns. Um, we're both uh, members of uh, the Truffle Framework team. Uh, just, I guess, a few logistical things. Um, if you can't hear or if, if there's an issue with um, seeing the screen, uh, audio, uh, just feel free to shout in the chat uh, and we can kind of pause to make sure, you know, try and get it rectified. Um, we'll also talk about how to ask questions and stuff shortly as well, um, but use the chat for any kind of oddities in terms of audio, video, etc. Cool. So um, in terms of uh, agenda for, for today's session, we'll start in a moment with uh, brief uh, bios of Ben and myself. We'll then spend a moment just to look at the goals, what we're going to try and have achieved uh, by the end of this session. We'll then do a quick look at or introduction or reintroduction for those that are already familiar with this space to Web 3.0 or the decentralized web as it's sometimes referred to, but in, a, in an enterprise context. Uh, we'll then spend a bit of time defining and exploring an enterprise Ethereum, but we won't just be lo looking at Ethereum, we'll be looking at other ledgers as well. Um, but given Truffle's predominantly an enterprise, you know, for Ethereum right now, that's kind of going to be the core, but we'll, we'll definitely look at others. Uh, we'll then spend a bit of time um, exploring the Truffle suite. Um, and then also uh, Truffle's kind of support for enterprise uh, ledgers or enterprise blockchains. Uh, we'll kind of spend the last kind of quarter or a third uh, on a demo, and I've put it in quotes because it's because this is quite a short webinar um, that we're kind of keeping it. Um, we've kind of flattened it down to, to screenshots. I mean, the, the gist is still you know very much there, uh, but just for ease and efficiency uh, on this one, and because given it's a bit shorter, we kind of flattened it down. And then we'll close out with uh, next steps for kind of learning more, um, discovering more, et cetera, and, and have a kind of Q&A at the end. On that point about questions, um, as mentioned, feel free to fire them into the chat. Uh, you just heard Jeff uh, in the background there. So him, um, he'll be kind of gathering them up. Um, of course, if it's something to do an issue with audio or video, uh, you know, we'll address it there and then. But if it's questions, um, we, there's, we, if it's a short one, we may you know, answer it in line during the session otherwise we'll kind of park them all for the end and they're kind of more deeper dive dive there sounds uh, great kevin um also just one quick note kevin we, we're not going to do a poll but we will okay. uh, send out a survey at the end and uh, as kevin said we're recording and we'll send out the deck as well thanks awesome yeah thank you jeff uh and as uh, yeah jeff already mentioned it that little red <laughs> ubiquitous red icon at the bottom of this slide you know we'll be recording and sharing so if you have to drop off early um, or whatever, you know, then, you know, we'll share it around uh, for posterity after the fact. Awesome. So very, very, very brief bios on Ben and myself. So myself, Kevin Bluer, I'm the head of content and training here at Truffle. I have probably about 15 plus years uh, in software development across, you know, many different stacks. Um, about five years kind of doing training also on different stacks. And about three to four years kind of playing in the blockchain, uh, ledger, Ethereum, et cetera, uh, space. So with that, I'll hand over briefly to Ben to introduce himself. Yeah, hi, I'm Ben Burns. I'm the head of blockchain services at Truffle. I joined Truffle in 2017, and um, I've worked on a few different areas of the tool suite. Uh, initially, it was, it was Ganache. It was maintaining Ganache. But um, more recently, I focus on enterprise solutions and enterprise product integrations. Awesome. Thank you, Ben. Cool. So yeah, in terms of goals for this session, just a few, really. Uh, the first one is a better appreciation of the kind of disruptive potential, sounds very fancy, of, of Web 3.0 or the decentralized web, um, as mentioned specifically in an in a enterprise uh, context. Similarly, come away with a kind of better understanding of how blockchains and or decentralized ledgers are benefiting uh, enterprises, both today, and we'll see a few examples, and kind of the future potential as well. And finally, know the role that Truffle and some of the other tools and services that we'll touch on play in the, in the solution kind of development life cycle. So if you did want to start exploring, building something for, for your company, or you know, if you're consulting for large firms, uh, then you know, how you go about starting and doing that. Kind of quick uh, disclaimer or caveat, uh, this is a pretty, much pretty introductory session or a 101, as it's sometimes referred to. 
we were kind of kicking ourselves after we scheduled this because we we really wish we'd actually asked for people's experience levels on the on the RSVP form or the registration form, and we didn't. <laughs> so we don't really, you know. And, and as always, you're going to get a, a spectrum of folks and experience levels. So we kind of decided to keep this one pretty intro level. Uh, but what we would love, um, you know, sincerely love, uh, following this, you know, as part of the feedback um, email, um, is to see what you'd like to be covered in the future. Uh, you know, we'd love to hear what topics, um, well, you know that we will cover and we will truly you know base the upcoming because we're going to be doing a series of these so that's our plan maybe once a month um so yeah we'll, we'll do it but you know for, first and foremost based on feedback so yeah definitely reach out and let us know what you'd like to see covered cool so it's kind of stepping back and looking at the bigger picture and again this this bit's going to be pretty brief um so introduction to web 3.0 if you're kind of new to this space or new to the paradigm very brief history lesson so web 1.0 um so I'm probably going back around 20 odd years now. Um, it's predominantly read-only in terms from a sort of end-user perspective of, of the web. It's pretty low fidelity, so it's mainly text and you know, low-res images. Um, and of course, the overall experience, albeit revolutionary at the time, was you know, relatively simple static sites. Web 2.0, it's kind of the era we're still in now. Um, we saw increasingly saw the, or have seen the rise of kind of read-write, again, from an end-user perspective. It's you know, trivial to kind of throw content out there. Uh, we've seen the rise of user-generated content, kind of the same thing, or user-created content. Richer content types are now kind of the norm, you know, be that you know, user-generated video or you know, streaming audio, et cetera. Um, and obviously the rise of social media, e-commerce, you know, kind of epitomizes the era we're in. On the kind of grayer or downs, well, not downside, but just kind of challenges, we've seen a kind of increasing siloing of data. So these large monolithic firms have kind of grown up in this era and you know hoover up all our data and it's kind of gray often gray as to who owns that data even though in kind of lip service terms it's, it's your data but is it really pretty gray um, and of course you know this is paradigms you know kind of um, epitomized by you know centralization that's kind of been the only way to kind of build these services typically um, that brings us to web 3.0 um, and again we're, this is you know we're in that kind of transitional state or it's you know evolutionary state right now what we're starting to see here and some of the potential at least is kind of more meaningful sovereignty of your data. So, you know, where we've got kind of grayness, you know, if it's your health data or identity data stored on third party kind of centralized infrastructure, now it's, you know, te you know technically possible um, and obviously arguably something you would want to have that, you know, more greater control over that data, which is arguably your data. Um, and, you know, you don't want prying eyes or, you know, you want to know what happens to that data. What we're also seeing is an increasing kind of disintermediation or the potential for, for that, um, wherein like these large monolithic firms, you know, not, not to bash them, you know, the services they offer, but again, they, you know, control a ton of, you know, <laughs> then your data and, the, you know, these huge services. What we're starting to see is the potential for, you know, building and operating these things a little differently, which is very, very exciting. Um, a mediated uh, read-write. Um, so, you know, although we had read-write in Web 2.0, you know, if a prying, you know, if a, government didn't like it or some you know third party didn't like it, it was pretty straight not straightforward but it was possible for it to be taken down in web 3.0 it's much harder if not impossible you know for content that gets put out there but you know for you know it's yours you put it out there and no one can you know tamper with it and finally provenance tracking so you know in terms of supply chains um much uh, deeper transparency you know kind of the audit trails and so on around these things and we'll see a kind of example of that in a moment so in a, in a few quotes, and we kind of dug in while putting this deck together, a few quotes uh, for what Web 3.0 is bringing, uh, bringing about. Um, I'm not mentioning names in this first quote, but ride sharing without X, apartment sharing without X, and social media without X and Y, whatever. Obviously, you can fill in the blanks, but you can do all these things um, you know, on you know, decentralized infrastructure, um, or at least we have the potential to do that. And there's obviously services kind of bubbling up to you know, mimic in a, you know, in a, you know, in a, you know, the same services that we experience you know, that are centralized, but in a decentralized manner. And, you know, and interesting benefits because of, uh, because of that. Uh, next one, unprecedented visibility and veracity into the sourcing and certification of fre fresh produce and protein. So that's kind of putting in context that um, provenance tracking. So you can actually uh, know, or, you know, confidently know from, you know, when, you know, whether it's, and we'll see an example, you know, um, some fish that's been, you know, taken out of the ocean and, you know, tagged and so on. And you know that, you know, that uh, confidently know that, that, you know, it's fish sustainably and, and so on. Uh, and finally, no 404. So, you know, that concept of not being able to take down data uh, and so on. And that's, you know, there's caveats to that, but, you know, it's definitely different in, you know, to what we've, what we've known thus far. Cool. Um, just a couple more slides on the kind of bigger picture stuff before we get you know a bit deeper into the you know the technology itself. 
Uh, so why is this important for enterprise? I think the first line here is the most, you know, most important one because it really kind of brings to bear new business models, new ways of doing things, new ways of creating value. Um, you know, and that's you know super exciting. And if you are, you know, an incumbent, you know, working for an incumbent, you know, large firm, you you know, you want to continually be exploring uh, either new ways of doing business, you know, and or you know trying to shift the current way in which you're doing business to you know adapt to those. You don't want to just have the the business model that you've always known kind of swept out from underneath you. So it's you know, absolutely important from that perspective. Also, you know, reducing the cost of establishing trust between, you know, perhaps semi-trusted or even like zero trusted uh, entities. Uh, again, historically, that's been pretty, you know, time consuming, expensive, very manual. Uh, you know, companies often kind of wrap themselves in um, <clears throat> legalese. Um, and that's great, you know, if, if things are working smoothly, all good typically. But of course, if it breaks down, then, to kind of work that out, you know, you need to bring in the lawyers, etc. And, you know, it's, it's just painful. Um, so again, with some of this technology that we'll again, be getting deeper into in a moment, you know, you can see how you know, we'll see how that, you know, makes a you know, big difference to the way in which that can be done. And then, and the kind of final two, obviously, increasing efficiency, accountability, and just generally, you know, it, what, you know, from an importance perspective, you know, future proofing your business. couple of examples. This is the last two uh, slides before we get a bit more into the kind of meteor uh, technical stuff. Um, JPM coin, I'm sure a good number of you may have heard of this. So this is JP Morgan. They um, released this coin. It's, it's not, it's been controversial because it's not necessarily seen as decentralized, at least yet. Um, <laughs> in their own words, uh, it's instant transfer of payments between inst institutional accounts. Really, it's kind of right, as of right now, at least, it's kind of internal, you know, business unit to business unit, at least as I understand it. Um, so it runs on a private network. Uh, we'll be looking at some sort of different topologies and so on in a moment. Um, although they, what they have stated is that it's going to be, you know, subsequently extended to other platforms. So whether that, you know, TBD as to whether that means like, you know, Ethereum mainnet or others, you know, we'll see. Um, the reason we call this one out is because it's built on some, on top of something called Quorum, which you may have heard, heard of, which is actually a fork of Ethereum, uh, sorry, a fork of Ethereum created by JPM themselves, uh, kind of really with a bunch of features for support, you know, deeper support um, of, you know, for private or consortium networks. Uh, and they've actually added a bunch of new features as well, um, such as the ability to send private uh, transactions between you know, different uh, parties on the, the network, um, something that's not possible on, on the public uh, mainnet at least. Uh, so yeah, so, somewhat controversial and it's caused a lot of buzz. One, one thing that kind of we think is really interesting with this and some analysis has kind of been you know, put forward about it is that kind of increasingly legitimizing the space. So for, you know, which is awesome, you know, if we you know, care about this paradigm in this space, you know, when big folks like this kind of wade in and experiment and do things like this, then that, you know, gets everyone, wakes everyone further up to it and the further legitimizes it. Another example um, is World Wildlife Fund, um, not the World Wrestling Federation, um, but uh, over in New Zealand um, and kind of touched on this in a, in a couple of the quotes um, and points earlier. So they've, um, partnered with Vient to build a solution to kill, keep um, illegal, it's a bit of a tongue twister this one, unreported and uh, unregulated fish or seafood uh, out of the supply chain. So really, you know, placing an emphasis on making sure fishing is done sustainably, you know, and uh, sort of from an end user or consumer perspective, you know, if you know, you know, and you can actually, you know, now more feasibly understand, you know, know that the food you're consuming has been caught sustainably, that's important. And now through the technology, we can actually kind of provably see that. Um, so again, they've used uh, VN's uh, platform um, and, you know, and doing so would have created a smart contract to start, uh, track the steps and then a combination of RFID to tag at the point of it being fished. And then, you know, as it kind of moves along the supply chain to you know, a restaurant or to your table, I think they use quick response codes to kind of track it, et cetera. So really, really interesting um, as a kind of use case. And again, we're, this is kind of it in terms of the kind of higher level fluffier stuff. Um, but if you did want to deep dive deeper into all the different kind of scenarios and use cases for the enterprise, uh, there's a great article which I'd recommend checking out on Consensus's site. Um, uh, link below, as I don't expect you to write it down right now, but um, you know we'll be sharing this um, deck after the, um, so you know you can dig in, or of course you can Google it. But it really just breaks down by each industry um, the you know the challenges they face. Um, well, thank you for whoever's drawn on that. <laughs> Uh, the challenges of facing there's some of the potential solutions that this technology uh, can can solve cool okay so we'll now spend a bit more time kind of defining and exploring kind of enterprise ethereum and just more broader enterprise ledgers 
Um, before I hand over to Ben, um, just a kind of quick um, summary of public Ethereum. And again, I know a lot of you on this call are you know, already building stuff, so, but this is really for folks that are kind of new to this space. Um, so in ethereum.org's own words, so Ethereum is the world's, fully pro world's first fully programmable blockchain. Essentially, you can build what they, it's called unstoppable apps, which I think is a really nice term, um, that run exactly as programmed without any possibility of any downtime, censorship, fraud, or third-party uh, interference. Basically, characteristics that are kind of impossible uh, on centralized you know, infrastructure or web 2.0 infrastructure. So you know, really, really interesting things that it brings you know, to the table. In terms of numbers, and I won't go through all the bullets here, um, but it's, you know, it's the most popular blockchain, e.g. 94% of the top 100 blockchain projects are built on top of Ethereum. By the way, I just realized I didn't have my video turned on, and I did intend to, so let me just do that. Um, so you can actually see me. There we go. Cool, sorry about that, and hi, everyone. Um, the other kind of takeaway from this one, before I pass over to Ben for a moment, um, is the developer community around this space. Um, and we'll be looking at Truffle and so on in a moment. But there's over 300,000 developers, which is more than any other blockchain maturity. And not that that in and of itself is important, but really they're just the mature, you know, maturity of the development tools and, and so on um, is arg arguably the, you know, the most uh, mature um, out, of all of, out of all of the blockchain. So you know, it's sort of interesting uh, stat there. Cool. So with that, I'll, I'll pass over to Ben, who's actually going to be dive, who's going to dive into enterprise Ethereum and and, and broader, you know, that you know, this all, um, doing this in the enterprise space. Yeah. So enterprise Ethereum, and I, I think it's it's actually most of what I'm about to say uh, also applies to just enterprise distributed ledger technology in general. But um, Truffle coming from kind of an Ethereum background, we, we kind of start from there and then work our way out to some of the other DLT technologies. So um, yeah, so, so as an enterprise, if you look at mainnet, one of the first things you're gonna notice is that the transactional throughput is fairly low. You know, you're, you're in the tens of transactions, low tens of transactions per second for, for total throughput. And uh, the latency is quite high. Our block times are around 12 to, to 15 seconds. Um, so it's going to take around that time, uh, around that amount of time at a minimum to process your transactions. So if you have applications that require low latency or high throughput, uh, you know, that's, that's going to be a bit of a problem for you. So, so, you know, enterprises really need what we call the three P's, uh, privacy, permissioning, and performance. Um, I just mentioned the performance issues, but privacy and permissioning, uh, are also pretty major considerations. So, so privacy on the public chain, um, is, is effectively nil. Um, you have these kind of pseudonymous uh, app, uh, addresses that you're operating under and, you know, everybody on the, the network, the public network can see all of the state changes in the public network, which, you know, if you're transacting on confidential, um, sensitive business, business information, then of course, you don't necessarily want the entire world, especially your competitors to be able to see that. Um, similarly for permissioning, you know, as a, as a company that's subjected to, you know, regulations and, and contractual concerns and, and things along those lines, you're likely going to have people in, um, uh, privileged positions for people who have access to information that other people shouldn't, um, have access to, and uh, th this is also true of your your infrastructure resources as well. So both uh, from a from a people standpoint and from an infrastructure node standpoint, a network standpoint, um, being able to to specify the the permissioning of your network, what what resources do these people or these nodes have access to, uh, is also very very important for a lot of enterprises. So, so really enterprise Ethereum and enterprise distributed ledger technology as a whole is, is concentrated on these three P's. Um, again, privacy, permissioning, and performance. Um, and also, I think, I think it's worth pointing out on that, uh, the, the main trade-off that we're getting there, that, that, we're, that we're driving there, comes from these, the consensus algorithms. So um, enterprise Ethereum allows you to swap out different components of your, of your node and your, your overall protocol, uh, whereas mainnet Ethereum, public Ethereum, uh, really relies on proof of work. It eventually will transition over to proof of stake, uh, but proof of stake is, is a little ways off yet. So. Next slide, please. So we talk about public versus enterprise. Um, 
actually, I just started started talking about this already. Uh, proof of work is definitely the name of the game on public Ethereum, and, and as I said, that's what's driving the performance there. Um, uh, I mentioned the pseudonymous transactions being not private, the, the transactional throughput being low, um, and public validator nodes are recording the entire history of the network. So if you have private information that, you know, uh, you, you shouldn't be exposing, you certainly don't want it on this indelible public record. And if you have information that's subject to, say, GDPR regulations, where you need to maintain your ability to delete that information after you know some period of time or, or upon request, um, you know, you definitely can't store any of that information that's subject to those regulations on a public chain. In fact, you, you might not, not be able to store them on a private chain either. So, so with Enterprise Ethereum though, as I mentioned, you can customize the consensus algorithm, which allows you to trade between uh, performance and the, the level of trust that you have for your counterparties. So if you're, if you're operating in a business context where um, you, know, you have a decent legal framework in place and you, you can trust uh, in your legal framework, then maybe your counterparty risk is, is somewhat mitigated by that and it's, you're in a better position to use uh, an enterprise ledger that has uh, a consensus algorithm that's more favorable to your performance needs, but sacrifices a little bit of that, um, that Byzantine fault tolerance. So yeah, so, so you get a lot of um, performance out of that. Um, you can also very, very carefully control uh, which nodes in the network are allowed to validate blocks. In other words, which nodes are allowed to approve transactions. So that's, that's part of the permissioning aspect. Um, you can get pretty high throughput. So we've seen demonstrations uh, up to the thousands of transactions per second. I think by the end of this year, so we've seen some, some early technology demonstrations uh, that, that are, are pushing like the 10,000 transaction per second range. So I think there's, there's a lot of really exciting things happening in the performance space in enterprise ledger technology as a whole. Uh, so, so definitely, you know, it, the, the, the upper bound of performance is a little bit squishy at the moment and it's the envelope is expanding very rapidly. Um, and then finally, there's, there's all kinds of different solutions out there for having private transactions between, uh, you know, the range of that is like in some networks, you can see that transactions have occurred, but you can't see the contents or the state changes of those transactions. In other networks, uh, you, can, you can basically have transactions that are 100% confidential uh, and only the counterparties that you're transacting with can see uh, the, the transactions in question. And then of course, finally, there's a, there's a hybrid model as well where you're operating part of your application on an enterprise uh, blockchain and part of your application on the public blockchain. And there's, there's a, a pretty big spectrum of, of uh, options there. But part of what you might see there is pegging information back to the public chain um, so that you know, there's, a, there's an indelible record of, of some snapshot of your state at some point in time but then all of the actual status kept private on your, on your enterprise chain. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so as, a, um, as an enterprise, you're, you're likely looking at blockchain technology on the whole and thinking to yourself, okay, well, you know, what is it really good for? How do, I, how do I know if it's a good fit for my needs? And this, this image is a decision tree. Um, it's, I apologize, it's a little bit small in the text, but it kind of walks you through the, um, the decision process behind whether or not you should use a blockchain, whether or not a blockchain is a good fit for your needs. So the way I like to think about it is if you have um, an asset that is uh, intangible, so let's say licensing or um, access to some kind of digital resource or warranties or anything like that, like that's a usually a great, great fit for a blockchain. Um, anything transferable like that especially is, is a great fit. Um, if you're going into the physical realm and you're doing things like supply chain tracking and that sort of stuff, it's still a great fit, but you're likely going to have some you know, real world solution necessary to actually enable that tracking. So it's not the blockchain by itself is a, a key enabler, but there's other components of the technology stack. Um, so, so some things to consider from this decision tree, uh, basically the type of asset you're working with, is it, is it digital or physical? Um, can you, are you trying to remove different intermediaries or brokers? Can you create a permanent or authoritative record of the digital asset in question? Do you require high performance um, or rapid transactions, especially transactions that need to complete uh, with low latency in like the millisecond time range? 
Uh, do you need to store large amounts of information, especially non-transactional information as part of your solution? And, and does that, that information need to be um, uh, modifiable or mutable? Uh, do you need to be able to update that information or, or does, it, does it need to be, is, is it okay if it's static? <clears throat> uh, do you want or need to rely on some trusted third party? Are you managing contractual relationships or some kind of value exchange? Or do you require shared right access? Uh, do contributors know and trust each other and are contributors' interests unified or well aligned? So, so that one's actually really interesting. Um, you know, if you're, if you're, again, if your contributor interests are unified or well aligned, um, you might not really need a blockchain because you can, you know, you can trust your, your counterparties. Um, but if you need to be able to control functionality tightly um, and, you know, there's some well-defined business process you're automating, then, then again, being able to model that on a blockchain is, a, is still, even in the context of, you know, having a really highly trusted business partner, being able to model those business processes on a blockchain is, is highly advantageous. So it's, it's really, it's interesting when you, when you look at all these different interactions and, you know, the decision of whether or not a blockchain is a good fit um, isn't always super clear right from the outset. But um, you know, it's it's uh, these are the types of things you you want to be listening to or you want to be uh, looking at. Next slide. So this is uh, this image here is a little bit much to take in all at once, but um, I'll kind of walk you through it. Basically, this is this is the architecture stack for an enterprise Ethereum application. Um, but if you think about it in terms of enterprise, enterprise distributed ledger applications as well, I, I think it's, it's still a pretty good fit. So down on the left column there, you've got, um, you know, from top to bottom, you've got different layers of the stack from the application layer all the way on down through to the network protocol layer, the lowest layer of the stack. And uh, the things in yellow and green are, are pieces that are, already provided by public blockchains or public Ethereum in this case. And the kind of lilac purple portions are portions that are more left up to enterprise blockchains to, to provide. So, you know, when you look all the way down at the network protocol stack, dev P2P is something that's uh, a piece of the protocol that's used to basically um, gossip around the existence of blocks and transactions so that the entire network uh, can learn when, when a new event has taken place. So if there's a new transaction and there's a new block. Well, in an enterprise context, you may want to have an enterprise peer-to-peer -peer protocol that uses, that, that adds a layer of authentication and permissioning so that blocks from trusted resources are the only blocks that are accepted. Um, similarly, in the core blockchain, you have on-chain private state, trusted execution, and private consensus. These are all things that really only apply to the enterprise context. And so the enterprise uh, Ethereum world and, and the enterprise distributed ledger world at large is kind of looking more at these areas than it is at the areas that, uh, that public Ethereum and public blockchains are, are, are really serving quite well. Um, I, I think I'll, I'll probably leave this there. There's, there's more we could talk to here, but in the interest of time, I think this is, this is probably good enough. Um, yeah. And so finally, you know, you, you're, you're going to be looking at this thinking like, okay, this is all well and good, but just how do I get started? Right. So apart from the truffle tool suite, which uh, Kevin will, will show you through in just a minute, you know, if you get to the point where you've, you've got your application coded up and you want to actually deploy it someplace, you're going to need a network to deploy it to, an enterprise network to deploy it to. So there's all kinds of great options out there. As far as hosted options go, um, the, the ones that we're well familiar with are Azure Blockchain, Kaleido, and AWS. Um, Azure Blockchain and AWS are, are, you know, obviously Azure and AWS are, are big cloud providers. And if you're already using those cloud providers, these can be great options for you. They both have their own managed blockchain solutions that are, that are quite interesting and quite feature rich. Um, Kaleido is an interesting one. Kaleido, if you, if you, have, if you aren't familiar with them, they, they give you a really nice kind of almost point and click, very rapid uh, blockchain creation process. If you're familiar with like Heroku or any of those, they, they really, they focus on a similar sort of uh, user experience where basically you know, you're up and running in, in, in the course of a couple of minutes. So Kaleido is one that I highly recommend if you, if you don't already have an existing cloud, in, cloud provider and uh, you just want to get up and running with a, let's, let, let's say a development network or a staging or even a production network re really rapidly. Awesome. And that's it for me. Okay, yeah, thank, thanks for that, Ben.
so as Ben kind of mentioned there, you know, that last slide was kind of assuming you're ready to start uh, either, you know, pushing up, you know, uh, some stuff to test, you know, with other parties, etc. What we'll look at now is the truffle suite, which is kind of everything you would do prior to that. Um, to, you know, actually build locally, test locally, um, et cetera. And then obviously from Truffle itself or through Truffle itself, you can actually migrate to these, uh, net, you know, the enterprise networks and so on. Uh, again, some of you are gonna be familiar with this. So this is, so in our own words, uh, Truffle is a world-class development environment testing framework and asset pipeline for Ethereum. Put an asterisk there or caveat just because we are, as uh, we'll be seeing a little more later, you know, supporting additional blockchains, ledgers, etc. Um, overall, you know, aiming to make life as an Ethereum developer or your life as an Ethereum developer easier. And this little graphic in the middle, um, from left to right, we've got the truck. These are just the funky little logos we have for each of the respective products in the suite. So truffle on the left, ganache in the middle, and drizzle on the right. And we'll, we'll go through those now. So starting with truffle. Um, it's, oh, sorry, yeah, this is truffle sweet still. Um, <laughs> we'll segue into truffle in a moment, but um, so at the um, truffle sweet level, it's comprised of a range of different tools uh, and components. I've put part of the impact stack. That's not really, a, I don't think, a widely circulated acronym yet, although it's starting to bubble out, uh, out there a little bit. Uh, we'll elaborate or unfurl that later, but the truffle is the T in that stack. So, you know, and, and the kind of takeaway from the point about it later is these are interesting tech technologies to explore just to get you know closer to the you know the kind of pieces in the puzzle if you were going to really start you know going all over and building kind of enterprise solutions on it uh, and the k there in it is actually collider as well uh truffle itself is 100 percent um free and open source software um hosted on github um, at github.com slash truffle suite um as of last week um and this is just truffle and we'll see the distinctions um of the different tools um in a moment but truffle itself had 1.5 uh, million downloads we've had 1.5 million downloads as of last week. Cool, so to jump into Truffle, I know it's a bit, I'll probably confuse myself there, <laughs> as I've been saying it, but you know, Truffle is one of the tools and it was the first tool and it's kind of the umbrella you know, term for the framework or Truffle framework, but it's actually kind of three tools with, with some additional things as well. Uh, so Truffle as the, one of the individual tools we'll go through now. Uh, so it's written in JavaScript, no JS, it's a command line tool. Um, so it does take, you know, if you are new to this space or don't have the, a deep you know, development background, it will, there'd be a little bit of a learning curve uh, for starting to use it. But assuming you, you know, have been you know, comfortable with command line tools and, you know, and so on, then it'd be pretty straightforward. Um, but really it's focused on reducing the complexity of you know, building decentralized apps or dApps. Um, everything from the compilation to the testing to the migration. And on the right hand side of this uh, slide, you can see kind of all the commands that the that Truffle comprises of. Uh, and it's currently at version 5.0, so it's pretty mature. It's been around for a good number of years. Um, I'm not sure when the first commit was, but I, a little kind of side note or anecdote. I remember starting to play with some, you know, Ethereum, uh, you know, development or decentralized app development, probably towards the end of November 20, or November, probably around November uh, 2015. And my goodness, I mean, I think Truffle was probably getting started back then, um, but uh, I didn't know about it and wasn't certainly wasn't using it. And uh, the the super super cumbersome to do <laughs> kind of anything you know ethereum there was you know docs out there they were pretty pretty uh patchy um and then I, and i kind of dipped out a little bit for you know for a while and then came back and then i and stumbled across truffle and it really you know did make you know huge difference i'm not trying to oversell it of course but you know it's really does fill in a lot of blanks in you know in terms of you know building uh dApps. So just kind of in use, um, and again, this is pretty, pretty intro level. Uh, once you've got it installed, you can just start to kind of fire off commands, everything to kind of create, you know, initialize a project, add assets to that project. Um, of course, you can do that through the IDE itself. If you want to add some you know, content, solidity files or whatever um, language you might be using, then obviously the compilation and it will spit out, you know, meaningful error messages, et cetera. Debugging, you can you know, kind of step through the, you know, the logic of your contract and you know, kind of interrogate you know, current state, et cetera. It's a pretty powerful debugger. And then obviously the final step, that's in a very whirlwind. <laughs> uh, you typically take a bit longer than that, but then you're ready to migrate it to uh, you know, either a test net, a main net, or you know, Kaleido, or whatever it might be. And of course, just migrating it locally as well. So you would be using that command uh, pretty soon as part of the workflow. Um, kind of a side note, this is kind of, um, uh, a super useful thing and you know again if you've been using truffle we've probably used some of these in the past um, we have this thing called truffle boxes um, 
I'm not sure if, uh, the exact number that we have at the moment, but basically what they are is kind of boilerplates or templates um, of everything from like, you know, just sample smart contracts, sample libraries, view, you, know, you know, views, et cetera, um, right through to kind of complete example decentralized apps where, the, you know, the full code, you know, for all the kind of components or pieces of, of it are, are there. Um, so awesome resource, a resource for um, both learning, kick, you know, learning and you know, getting more deeper into this space if you're new to it and you know, kind of kickstarting projects. Um, and kind of from this left to right on the screens here, so we have a bunch of kind of officially supported ones by you know, us as Truffle. Um, we also have um, some partner ones. So that, that screen, uh, that example box in the middle is, and, and they have, you know, Microsoft have put a bunch more than this um, for Azure. So for building for the, um, the Azure blockchain workbench. Um, and you know, they're not just hello blockchain, but they have a bunch of you know, more kind of real world examples. And then on the kind of right there is just you know, an example of one of the community boxes. So I'd say there's a ton of all these you know, awesome community boxes that you know, folks out there have kind of built and just put, put up as a box. So you know, all of which, you know, just as I said, is a, is a great resource for kind of learning and getting deeper and more familiar with this space. Cool. So that, in a very, very brief nutshell, was Truffle itself. And we'll see a little more when we get to the demo um, uh, in a moment. Uh, but Ganache, so Ganache is another piece of the puzzle. So this is actually just like a local blockchain. Um, so, you know, rather before you actually get to the point of pushing up anything to either a testnet or, you know, um, Kaleido or any of, any of the things that Ben mentioned earlier, you obviously want to start building and working with that locally. We've done fully offline, you know, um, uh, and, you know, so as I mentioned there, you know, instant Ethereum network for both development and test it comes in two flavors, uh, both a UI version, which we'll look at a screenshot of which in a moment, and a command line version, which was kind of the genesis of it, it's formerly named uh, something called test RPC. Um, and some really nice things that have come uh, in Ganache version two, um, we'll see a screenshot, uh, but in a moment and a little more during the demo, where you can actually kind of visually explore uh, contract state, events, transactions, and so on, and kind of click into things that you've migrated uh, to, again, all locally at this point. Uh, so really, really powerful as a you know, way to just get ever increasingly familiar uh, with this stuff if, if you are kind of new to it and just starting out. And there's a screenshot of, of Ganache. Uh, when you open it, um, it creates 10, and again, all of this is kind of dummy, fictitious stuff, of course, but it creates 10 accounts, each loaded with uh, 100 Ether. Um, and then you can see along the top there, the different kind of sections of Ganache where you can you know, see the blocks as they're mined, see the transactions as they uh, are sent in, uh, see the, and as of 2.0, actually see the contracts and, and interrogate all the things that we just mentioned, see events, et cetera. Uh, so really, really useful tool and, you know, a no brainer to, as a place to start with if you're, you know, just familiar, you know, just starting out in this space, as I mentioned. Uh, so Drizzle, kind of final, um, piece of chocolate or a <laughs> thing um, under the Truffle uh, framework or Truffle Suite. Uh, and Drizzle's a uh, React JS based uh, component library or UI library for building the kind of web interfaces for your uh, dApps or decentralized apps. Um, it's kind of the newest piece of the Truffle Suite um, and you know, kind of rapidly evolving. But what it does do is you know, just takes care of the synchronization of, you know, of your contract state, the transactions, et cetera, synchronizing them down to the browser. It's reactive, so if things change, you, know, you don't have to kind of Requery it to get it an update. It just you know hand you know that's the magic of React <laughs> as you know as an underpinning uh, or dependent library there, um, and everything you know all the all the the data that I mentioned is you know is, um, synchronized down to a Redux store, so really easy to kind of uh, work with. And this is just uh, an example screenshot um, of the UI that you might build. Obviously, it's more of like Hello World style or To Do. <laughs> it's a little bit beyond Hello World, but you can just see it as an example of things you can build with Drizzle. Cool. Uh, so with that, I'll briefly hand back to Ben um, just to kind of touch on some of our support, uh, but current, well, both current and upcoming support uh, for enterprise built into Truffle right now. Yeah, so um, Truffle for Enterprise, fortunately, Truffle for Enterprise is shaping up to look pretty much like Truffle for Mainnet. So the development experience that we're providing for the various uh, blockchains and distributed ledger technologies that we're, that we're supporting, uh, basically, it all boils down to a little bit of configuration that you change in your project level configuration file. And then everything else pretty much stays the same. You develop, test, uh, migrate, all of that good stuff, just, just like you always would. Um, in the case of distributed ledger technologies, which actually use the, the underlying EVM, um, the same EVM, of course, that powers Ethereum, we also allow you to uh, do your initial development work on Ganache, so you can, you know, 
fire up your your automated testing and all of that through Ganache. You can use the the awesome Ganache 2.0, uh, super super uh, you know contextual information that we have in there. We call it less hex, more text. Um, so all of that is is totally still applicable for you if you're working on one of these um, uh, uh, chains, one of these distributed ledgers that supports the EVM. So there are a few uh, distributed ledgers out there that that don't have EVM support. I think Corda is really the only one on this list that. Um, as far as I'm aware, has no option for EVM support. So even in the case of Hyperledger Fabric, um, they're working on chain code right now, which actually includes an EVM and allows you to deploy um, Solidity smart contracts out onto Hyperledger Fabric. So, so really all of these are, um, you know, they're, they're moving toward the EVM, again, with the exception of Corda. So as far as support goes, um, we're working on support for pretty much the entire list here. Quorum support in particular is going to be out in the next release or two. Um, we had some early Quorum support uh, prior to Truffle 5 that uh, it worked with kind of the, the sort of very basic mainline cases, but didn't support things like private transactions and, and that sort of stuff. So we're, we're improving our support there pretty drastically. Uh, as far as Hyperledger Fabric and Sawtooth go, um, we have some beta integrations with them that are, that are out there. Feel free to reach out if you, need, uh, if you want to get access to those. And um, Pantheon is great. Pantheon basically tests against Truffle out of the box. So if you're using Pantheon, nothing really you need to do. Just, just use Pantheon and Truffle and enjoy life. Um, Axe Core, there's going to be an integration coming out soon uh, with them. And Corda is going to be a slightly longer term target for us, but we're still expecting to release support for that this year. So um, definitely also, if, if uh, you know, if, if, as far as prompts for feedback go, if you're interested in seeing any deeper dives on our support for any one of these ledgers, you know, include that, that detail in your feedback. We'd love to, to provide additional training um, and, and make sure that we're supporting the ledgers that you all care about the most. Thanks. Cool. Yeah, thank you, Ben. Um, so I'm just conscious of time. Um, so as mentioned, we've got a demo. Um, this is going to be a pretty lightweight demo for now, at least. Um, what we'll do is create a new project. And again, it's just flattened down at screens. So <laughs> just to set your expectations appropriately, we'll be kind of doing it live from my desktop, at least in this webinar. Um, but we'll, we'll see what it takes to create a new project, open it in Ganache. We've already seen a few of those screens already, but we'll kind of dive a little bit deeper. Uh, then we'll actually just create an example consortium network um, on Kaleido. So it'll be three nodes, kind of simulating you know, a supply chain kind of provenance style scenario. And then we'll just see what it kind of takes to migrate um, your project to that or your contracts to that, um, and then send a transaction. Um, and I put just here as a kind of additional bullet, like a deeper dive coming on this soon. So this obviously is a pretty, you know, High level demo, pretty, we'll go through it pretty rapidly, rapidly in the interest of time, but we'll almost certainly do a deeper dive on this. And as Ben mentioned, you know, um, and you know, we'd love feedback on other things that you'd love to see. Um, and you know, we'll definitely be doing webinars around those. We'd love to do webinars around those. So as we kind of, you know, just kind of re-summarize, you know, what it would take to create a project, um, just truffle in it, done. It creates a, and we'll see in the next screen the, what it writes to disk at that point. Uh, and then you can either add assets using the create command or add tests or contracts. Um, of course, you can do that in the IDE of, uh, you know, equally easily, if not easier. Um, or if you want to use a box, the command for um, unboxing a box is truffle unbox and then the name of the box. So you can see that if you go to truffleframework.com slash boxes and, and all the steps are there for doing it as well. But it's literally from the command line, at least it's just that. And then it will pull down. Um, or the, you know, the entire project and you know, kind of set it up as needed because some of them have a bit of additional kind of uh, configuration, but it does you know, most of that automatically. Um, after an init um, and adding a contract, this is what you'll see in your, in your local file system. Um, we have kind of conventions baked into it. So there's a contracts directory where you put your uh, smart contract files, you know, um, Solidity, Viper, et cetera. There's a migrations directory that stores the kind of logic for actually what you're choosing to migrate up to whatever network you've configured in the truffle config file. Another directory um, for tests, or test singular, but that's where you store your tests that you're gonna run against, uh, everything. And then obviously just use your kind of Node.js package, um, package file in there as well. So that's kind of really a minimalist, empty, empty style thing, but that's kind of what you get off the bat. Um, at that point, if you wanted to then open it in Ganache, so we saw a screenshot earlier of, you know, a kind of a, a vanilla Ganache instance just opened and you see the, the 10 accounts that it created. If you want to actually kind of 
load that project that you've just created into Ganache, what you do is just go, you know, from um, upon first load, it would say open uh, workspace or create workspace. Just drill into the config file, open it, and then, you know, save workspace. And then you actually can see the project directly in here. So you could actually drill into the contract itself, um, as we were kind of alluding to earlier, uh, see the address that's been created for, you know, the, because uh, you have had to have, my, I didn't show this step, but you'd obviously have to have migrated the contract to it in the same vein that you would do it to anywhere. Um, you can see the state, see any transactions that are executed against that contract, uh, events and so on. Uh, so really, really nice in terms of, you know, visually seeing this. So it really does kind of like lower, like lessen the learning curve um, a little bit, at least to, for some of this stuff. So anyway, back to the kind of demo <laughs> caveat that it's a little lightweight. Um, we've created a, a kind of very simple project. We've obviously put in some, you know, created a simple smart contract. We've migrated that at least to Ganache locally now. We've perhaps started to play around with it. We might have uh, tested it, de debugged it, et cetera. Um, and at that point, we're ready to push it up to, uh, say, Kaleido. And we want to now perhaps test it in, you know, with some other parties. Um, so this is Kaleido's kind of initial UX. Um, what, one thing that's awesome about Kaleido is they have a great free tier as well. So you can literally just get started with this. Um, without even having to put your credit card in. Um, as I mentioned, I think you know, the Heroku analogy is pretty spot on because they've really done an awesome job of you know, making the UX you know, really, really user-friendly um, and not scary at all. <laughs> so if you're new to this, it's kind of like, cool, this is, I feel like, like I can do this. So there's you know, a few things that you would go through. They have some awesome tutorials as well, so you can kind of go through and follow along from Kaleido's side to set some of this stuff up. So you can add nodes to the network. You know, in this case, it's, you know, it's like an example consortium network. This would be a supplier node or a supplier organization. Now, assuming we've done that three times, we've got three different uh, nodes, each owned by a different piece of the consortium. Um, so the suppliers, the shippers, the retailers. Um, what you also get kind of for free within Kaleido is a built-in block explorer, a pool of ether that you can distribute to uh, the different participants on the network, obviously. There's obviously stuff around credentials and you know, making sure, you know, adding different organizations so they set up their own um secrets and so on so you know no one member of the organization has you know full control over everything otherwise it's not really a consortium network um, so yeah really really simple and then you can uh you know see that we've set up an example here um, and at this point if we want to then migrate it to um to you know the consortium network it's all you know i didn't really look at this command earlier and again apologies for the speed with which we're going through this uh, we use truffle migrate so we've um, and you actually specify the name of the network as a, an additional parameter in this case it's supplier node all of the configuration and details for you know uh, for in this case Kaleido uh, would be in the truffle config file uh, the reset command kind of just reset state and we kind of um, uh, rather you know um, and will allow you to kind of redeploy everything I should say and then it, this is the output that gets uh, spat out and then that, let's say that that's um, made it up to Kaleido it usually takes you know a few minutes or Bit less you know 10 15 seconds whatever um and then you can actually drill in and see the blocks that are, you know as they're created transactions as they're executed um, from the block explorer similar to etherscan and others if you've used them on on mainnet or test nets uh, and you can also drill in and see the actual smart contracts uh, themselves and all the transactions that have been you know run against them and so on so really really nice you know and a great ux uh, for doing that and then finally, and again, apologies for this the speed with which we've gone through this um, let's say we want to kind of send a transaction uh, there so this is just a blob of JavaScript that's making a call. Um, it's using the Truffle artifacts and um, uh, requiring uh, simple storage, which was the contract that we used, I think. I mean, this was a bit cobbled together, this, this one. And then we just wanted to execute that. Again, you can do that using the exec command. Um, of course, you could then, which we didn't see in this, uh, build you know, web user interface and you know, use MetaMask to execute the transaction or sign the transaction and so on. Um, and then yeah, so but within so essentially running this would uh, choose to, you know, specify to execute this against the supplier node. This was the uh, reference to this file above, and you can see that in this case it's setting the value to sixty five, um, and then you can see the transaction hash, and then done. Cool. So again, that was super quick. I'm very conscious of that. So it really was just to kind of give you a flavor of the different steps that you would go through. Um, and as mentioned, we will definitely be kind of doing deeper dives on this um, uh, in upcoming webinars. Cool. So in terms of kind of learning more and uh, next steps, uh, to learn more, um, started these, uh, mentioned a few of these already, of course, Truffle Boxes. We also have tons of tutorials on our site as well to get started with all things related to Truffle. Um, so this is the kind of unfurling of what the impact stack 
uh, it's basically a collection of different you know, players in this space. So in Fura, Metamask, Pegasus, uh, who uh, create Pantheon. Um, sorry, Pantheon, who create Pegasus. I, I think that should actually be Pantheon. Uh, Alethio, Kaleido, and Truffle. So I won't, because in the interest of time, ex you know, expand on any of those, but they're great things to look at in you know, projects um, or companies to look at in their own right with their respective services and tools. Also, you know, have a dig into the enterprise Ethereum okay, alliance. Sorry, the email. Um, yeah, dig into the enterprise Ethereum alliance. Um, this is a, a consortium in the perhaps more traditional sense or an organization um, who is kind of driving, you know, uh, standardization, uh, specifications, interoperability, uh, certification programs, etc. So if you haven't heard of it and dug into it. Uh, and then this is just some of the members of uh, the EEA along the bottom there. Cool. And then in terms of kind of next steps, um, feel free to reach out anytime. So I put my email address up there. It's Kevin at Truffle Framework. Um, if you want to, you know, I can loop in Ben or any of the folks on the team uh, as needed. Um, we also, you know, if you're interested in, you know, talking further about um, either training, support, you know, um, exploring app building solutions, you know, these are things we're starting to offer as a, as a company. So, you know, love to speak to you guys about that. Um, we also have, well, we also have an event section on our website. There's only a couple of events up there now, but as mentioned, we'll, that's where we'll be listing upcoming webinars and in-person events and so on. We also have TruffleCon, which is our yearly conference. This will be the second one, um, August 2nd to 4th. I think that's the right dates um, at Microsoft's headquarters over in Seattle. Uh, there's detail. You can register your interest there. We don't have the actual registration up there for it yet. Uh, also, if you're not on it already, sign up for our newsletter. You can do it directly from our homepage. Just kind of scroll halfway down the page and you'll see the, the registration form. Uh, and then, as mentioned, finally, look out for the feedback email on this. Um, we love feedback. We're obviously quite aware that this was kind of intro level and we will be doing you know, more technical, you know, deeper dives um, you know, in upcoming webinars. But you know, what we'd also love to do, as mentioned, is you know, hear about the topics you'd love to you know, hear about from us. So you know, definitely let us know. We'd love to hear. Cool. So yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you for sticking with us to the end. We ran, I think, uh, slightly. Uh, hopefully, it was worth it. If you're still here, um, I guess if there are any questions, you know, we'll be able to see them in the chat, uh, so we can kind of answer them now. Um, but as mentioned, I'll jump back to here. So if you, you know, if we're a bit cut short or you don't you know, have a question after the fact, feel free to to ping me here, um, and then we can you know take it offline. Uh, so with that, yeah, thanks again. Um, and then Jeff, I don't know if any questions have come through. Um, Give you a moment to kind of perhaps yeah. yeah um there's a question actually about testing with python um i guess i'll just go ahead and answer that in the in the chat here so um i can't i can't give any timeline for this but we are actively working on making our test suite or our testing capabilities a lot more language agnostic um we actually want to make truffle as a whole a lot more language agnostic as well so you can see that today in truffle 5 for instance in our support with uh our support of the Viper language. Um, actually, the, the people behind the eWASM project, if you've heard of that, that's the, the Ethereum 2.0 project to actually make um, the new version of Ethereum support a WebAssembly. Uh, the people who are working on that project are actually using Truffle to build Rust uh, code for eWASM, the new eWASM target. So um, language agnosticity is definitely a, a high priority for us, but um, unfortunately we have a lot of high priorities right now, so we're, we're working on a bunch of different things in tandem. So definitely keep, keep an eye out. Um, if, you're, if you're looking for being able to write tests in another language, I, I think that's a feature you'll, you'll certainly see uh, sometime in the next year or so. Awesome. Cool. So if there's no other questions, um, we can wrap up now. Um, if you do have a burning question or a question that comes after, you know, uh, after the fact, as mentioned, reach out, email address is up there. Otherwise, thanks for attending. And, and thank you to Ben for, uh, for your session uh, sections too. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah. Thank you guys. Thank you. See you all soon. Bye-bye. Take care.